see what a morning gloriously bright with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem folded the grave clothes tomb filled with light as the angels announce Christ is risen see God's salvation plan wrought in love born in pain paid in sacrifice fulfilled in Christ the man for he lives Christ is risen from the dead see Mary weeping where is he laid as in sorrow she turns from the empty tomb hears a voice speaking calling her name it's the master the Lord raised to life again the voice that spans the years speaking life stirring hope bringing peace to us will sound till he appears for he lives Christ is risen from the dead Father, ancient of days, through the Spirit who clothes faith with certainty. Honor and blessing, glory and praise to the King, crowned with power and authority. And we are raised with Him, death is dead. Love has won, Christ has conquered. And we shall reign with him, for he lives, Christ is risen from the dead. And we shall reign with him, for he lives, Christ is risen from the dead. Welcome to the Partnership Shared Service on the second Sunday in Easter. And uh, I, I thought it was lovely. The, the picture you saw earlier, uh, the sunrise, was actually taken on Easter Sunday this year. We come together to share together what happened when Jesus rose from the dead, the implications of that, the peace that he brings to us. And Anne will lead us in the service. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he has, has given, given us new life and hope. He, he has raised, raised Jesus from the dead. God has claimed us as his own. He, he has, has brought us out of darkness. darkness. He has made us light to the world. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The risen Christ calls us to turn away from sin and be faithful to, to him. As we offer ourselves in penitence and faith, we renew our confidence and trust in his mercy. Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes, as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. 
We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. And so may the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Holy Spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Before Anne leads us in our collect for the week, I want us to reflect for a moment on the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, it is right at this time for us to pray for our Queen and Royal Family and to give thanks to God for all that Prince Philip has brought to this country. God of our lives, we give thanks for the life of Prince Philip, for his love of our country and for his devotion to duty. We now entrust him to your love and mercy through our Redeemer, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Risen Christ, for whom no door is locked, no entrance barred, open the doors of our hearts that we may seek the good of others and walk the joyful road of sacrifice and peace to the praise of God the Father. Amen. Amen. And before we hear our Bible reading and uh, the talk from Jim Bonham, who is a member of St Peter's, let's take a moment with this next hymn to open our hearts to the risen Lord in our midst. Alleluia, Alleluia, opening our hearts to Him, singing Alleluia, Alleluia, Jesus is our in us, O oh God, a humble heart that sets us free to proclaim the wondrous majesty of our Father in heaven. Alleluia, Alleluia, opening our hearts to Him. Jesus is our King. We bear the name of Christ. Justified we meet with Him. His words and presence come our fear, revealing God our Father here. Alleluia, Alleluia, open Kindred voices join, honoring the Lamb of God, who teaches us by bread and wine the mystery of His body. Alleluia, Alleluia, opening our hearts to Him. Alleluia, Alleluia, Jesus is our King. Pour out your Spirit on us, and 
from the Gospel of John. It was evening on the first day of the week and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not there with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. We're now in the Easter season, and the events of the crucifixion are just behind the disciples. It had had such an impact upon their lives course the crucifixion itself but the week before the crucifixion perhaps it began in John chapter 12 if you remember the chief priests had been planning to kill Lazarus and by doing so take away some of the credibility and the force of the movement that Jesus was leading going ahead and that was followed shortly afterwards uh, by the triumphal entry of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, I guess interpreted by many as Jesus heralding, if you like, a new kingdom, but not necessarily a spiritual kingdom, an earthly kingdom, an opportunity to overthrow Roman captivity and to free the Israelites to be their own people again. A little bit later, uh, shortly after that, Jesus predicts his own death. And the disciples just can't really understand this. They can't understand what's happened. They've been at the forefront of something so exciting. And then, of course, in John chapter 18, we're told that Jesus uh, was arrested at night in that kind of dramatic way. And Peter goes on to deny him, something he said he would never, ever do. And then, of course, it's the events of the crucifixion itself. Horrendous. The disciples scattered, his followers in complete disarray. And then the momentous events of Jesus' death. The next day, Peter and John run to the tomb. And the tomb's empty. Jesus appears to Mary. But we're picking up the account in verse 19 when the disciples are in a room locked away with the doors closed. Why, why were they locked away? Well, it had been an exhausting week for them physically and emotionally. If you remember, the disciples in Gethsemane were so tired that they fell asleep. The events uh, of the week were tremendously vivid in their mind. 
But perhaps more importantly, everything that they believed in had been left in tatters. They'd been seeing themselves as heroes welcoming in a vanguard of new freedom for the Israelites in particular and perhaps for others too. They were serving an unstoppable cause, as they saw it, with a tremendous leader in whom they had enormous faith. And that cause would liberate Israel, turn them into heroes, and all of that gone. Their leader was dead. They weren't quite sure what the significance of the empty tomb was. And they were a group of cowards, if you like, on the run. And I'm sure that, in part, is how they saw themselves. What would happen to them? What would happen to their families? Would they survive? Or would they be arrested and beaten and eventually killed in the way that Jesus had been killed? There are modern parallels. There are things that are going on in the world and have gone on uh, just recently that remind us of some of those events. The events of the demonstrators in Hong Kong, people of Myanmar that have been demonstrating in the street. And I guess at times they feel jubilant and that they're able to change things. And then some of their leaders are caught, sometimes imprisoned. Some of their followers are killed. And within themselves and within the people that they represent, I guess they become quite fearful and dispirited, thinking, is this all worthwhile? Are we going to really make any difference? Is this going to have an impact? And I suspect that there'll be some of those things are going on in the minds of the disciples. And it's in that time of tremendous turmoil that Jesus steps into the room, quite literally, the locked room uh, in which they were uh, staying in. The doors were not only closed, but they were locked. And what does he say? Well, what he says in verse 19, he says again in verse 21, and again to Thomas in verse 26. And what he says is, peace be with you. And in my Bible at least, it's peace be with you, with an asterisk after, uh, after that, an exclamation mark. Uh, each time that he says that. What was the, this peace and why was it so important? And that's what it, I want to explore a little this morning. I suspect many of you know that there are different words for peace as we translate it in the Bible. And there are two relatively common words. The Greeks uh, translated it as irene. And the Jews are a word that we're perhaps a bit more familiar with, shalom. And both of those words mean a lot more than perhaps the way that we generally interpret peace today. The Cambridge Dictionary uh, today describes peace as a state of not being interrupted or annoyed by worry, problems, noise or unwanted actions. I guess many of us would be saying chance would be a fine thing, that might happen. But nevertheless, I think you take the sense of this, that the peace is, if you like, the absence of something. And that wasn't really what the sense of either of these two words, either the shalom referred to in the Old Testament very often, the Hebrew shalom, um, or this uh, Irene, Greek concept of peace used so often in the New Testament and in fact used here. The, the word shalom has in it, if, if you like, a sense of wholeness, of fulfilment or well-being, of completion. In fact, it was said of uh, when they were rebuilding uh, the walls uh, in, in, recorded in Nehemiah in the Old Testament, that the walls, when the final bricks were put in place, the walls were being shalomed they were being completed, they were being fulfilled. And there is something of that uh, sense of, of shalom, that fulfilment, that's meant by the Hebrew word peace. 
But the Greek word means is perhaps something slightly different from that. It, it is really emphasising the existence of harmonious relationships. Harmonious relationships between God and man, between one another. That by there being a harmony results in a state of rest and contentment. It could have been, for instance, in in uh, the Bible verse that says, "If God be for us, who can be against us?" If you want, if if we're in keeping with God, if we're in line with God's will, then we can be at rest. We can be at peace. And it was that that the disciples so desperately needed. Their whole time, their whole lives were out of joint. And things needed realigned. They needed to know and be reassured that God was on their side, that he loved them, that he'd accepted them. And for Peter, of course, uh, that his denial could be forgiven. They needed to have the relationships restored with both God and man. They needed to know that they could be in harmony with the people, with one another, but also the people that they were trying to serve. And the peace that Jesus brought would do exactly that. That must have had a tremendous impact for the risen Christ to be standing among them, explaining that he was there to bring exactly that kind of peace. And of course, it's that kind of peace that would lay the foundations for them to receive the Holy Spirit and be part of the events of Pentecost. So why is uh, this important to us? Of course it's important to us at any time, but it's perhaps most important at the minute when many, many of us have been through a time of quite profound anxiety and turmoil. Some have lost loved ones. Others face an uncertain future with not being clear about whether jobs are still there. And what will this mean for our children, perhaps coming up to leaving school, what, how will it affect their future going forward? We, like the disciples, have been quite isolated. We've been locked away in, in a similar sense, the way the disciples were. And in a very similar way, it's been, at least in part, fear that's been holding us there, fear of what might happen if we step out, if we meet others, will we become ill? Will we perhaps um, infect others? We really do need the peace of God at this Easter time, perhaps more than many, to restore those relationships and to give us confidence to step out into the world again. Most importantly, of course, we need the peace of God to go on being filled with the Holy Spirit and to fulfil the mission that God has for our lives. I think this morning, God would want to speak peace into our lives. Jesus would want to remind us that things have not gone awry, that we're not outside of God's plan, that Jesus loves us, that he's on our side, that he has restored the relationship between us and God and can restore relationships between one another. Let's commit ourselves into that peace and take hold of it with both hands. Christ, our risen Lord, no tomb can keep you. No door is closed to you. No heart is barred to you. No mind is shut off from you. Come lead us out of darkness into light, out of doubt into faith, out of death into life eternal. Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. We pray for all who witness to your resurrection, for those who speak your presence, for preachers of the word and ministers of the sacraments, for those who reveal your presence by the way they live, for all who live simply, that others may live. We pray for all who are in doubt and for all those who are seeking you. 
We pray for unity in the church and in the world. We call to you, my Lord and my God. We come today with the oppressed peoples, with all who have lost their freedom, all who have lost their hope. We pray for all who have been taken hostage and all who have been imprisoned because of their beliefs, that in darkness they may find your love. We call to you, my Lord and my God. We pray for any fellowship to which we belong, for communities and clubs, for welfare organisations, for social groups, for those with whom we share our worship. We give thanks for your appearing in the upper room and pray for our homes and loved ones. We call to you, my Lord and my God. We remember all who are despairing, for those who doubt their abilities. We pray for all who lack confidence, those afraid to trust themselves or others. We remember all who are lonely, all who are fearful. We pray for those in sickness, looking to you in hope. O risen Christ, we call to you, my Lord and my God. Risen Lord, in you is our hope, in life, in death, and to eternity our hope is in you. We rejoice with all who have entered into the fullness of life eternal. We pray especially for loved ones departed. May we with them have a share in your eternal kingdom. We call to you, my Lord and my God. Amen. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is risen from. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is Lord of heaven and Jesus is Lord of heaven and Jesus is Lord of heaven and Jesus is Lord Jesus is Lord Jesus is Lord Jesus is Lord of heaven and Jesus is living in Jesus is living in his Jesus is living in his Jesus is living Jesus is living Jesus is living Jesus is living in his church Jesus is coming for his Jesus is coming for Jesus is coming for his own. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming for his own. Now we join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Towards the end of our service, uh, I want to lead us in a, uh, a commitment to the risen Christ. Christ died, died for, for our sins, sins in accordance with, with the scripture. scripture. He, he was buried, he was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Afterwards, he appeared to his followers and to the apostles themselves. This we have received and this we believe. Amen. Amen. And so may this risen Christ who breaks through the, the locked doors of our hearts to bring his peace. May you know that peace in your life this week as you seek to serve God and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. And thanks for joining us. Peace to you, we bless you now in the name of the Lord. Peace to you, we bless you now in the name of the Prince of Peace. Peace to you, peace to you. We bless you now in the name of the Lord. Peace to you. We bless you now in the name of the Prince of Peace. Peace to you. Peace to you.